All right. Well, uh, this should be the last of the uh, finances le um, lessons. So here's just a little test on how to um, gauge your um, financial wisdom. What would you do if you had $5,000 in your bank account right now? You, if somebody gave you $5,000, they just gave it to you. You didn't have to work for it, you just had it. What would you do with it? Do you, do you already know how you would have it spent? Did the money burn a hole in your pocket, as my dad used to say? He used to say that to me all the time. Don't, don't, don't let money burn a hole in your pocket. It, it really irritated the crap out of me. But then as I grew older, I started understanding what he was saying. And... Uh, would you instantly have that spent? Would you just set it aside for savings? Would you invest it into anything? You know, these are the things that, 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 that help us to gauge you know, where our heart is. And remember, this is just between you. I mean, nobody's, nobody's around or anything. You can be honest with yourself. If you had a credit card that had no limit, would you keep putting money on it, or would you only spend what you have? If you had a credit card that had no limit on it, would you keep putting money on it, or would you only spend what you have? Do you have a credit card now? Does it have a limit, and did you reach that limit? Did you pay it off every month? See, these are the things that kind of help us to gauge. It's easy to say, oh, no, I wouldn't do that, but then when we're in that situation, we do. Do you buy things on impulse? Do you buy things that, that you, do you find yourself buying more things that you want than things that you need? Um, think of it like this. Here's a little bit of a reality check as far as your spirit. If you had a credit card that you that didn't have to be there, there, there was no late fees and no interest charges. Okay, you could put however much money on it, and there would never be a fine. Would you pay it off, or would you keep using it? So. Um, Don't buy on imp don't ever buy something on an impulse. Don't ever buy something when you when just when you feel it. Ask yourself a series of questions. Should I buy this? Okay, do I do I need this? Is this something that I actually need? Then you save up for it, and then you shop for it, and then you buy it. What we do nowadays is oftentimes we buy something and then we shop, and then we try to save up, and then we ask, wait, should I supposed to buy this in the first place? Or we start shopping for something before we even have money for it. And before we even asked ourselves, do I really need this? And then we buy it. You know, so um, I, I remember one time I was selling some, I was selling a car and somebody called me and said, I'm really interested. I just I just got to get the money together. Well, if you don't have the money together, you shouldn't be shopping for a car. So um, wanting, wanting isn't a reason. Self-control and discipline are a must when it comes to finances. Wanting is not a reason to buy something. And so ask yourself that. So first off, self-control. I, I just If you ever feel like you absolutely have to have something, wait a couple weeks to buy it. See if you still absolutely have, have to have it. And then also discipline. It takes discipline to have a credit card, to have money on your credit card, to have money in your account that you can spend, to go shopping, and not buy everything that you see. It takes it takes takes discipline. Um, Power of twenty two four. You know there there. You know some people have these. Oh, th this is how you get rich. Stop stop spending money and you'll stop stop getting poor. Um, it's like this. When I used to go on, on 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 trips with my dad, he used to always say, "You make better time with the side door shut." It's the same way with money. Your money adds up quicker if it's not being spent so quickly. <laughs> so, anyways. Um, Proverbs 22.4 says, The reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Don't spend money you don't have. Buying a TV when you owe somebody else or purchasing on payments. Um, so th think about it like this. Let's say you owe the credit card company uh, $200, but you ha you just moved to a new house, and so you want to buy a new TV. Well, 
if you already owe somebody, you don't buy something because that money that you have, money that you have when you owe somebody, that's not your money. That actually belongs to the person that you owe, um, regardless of whether you decide to do the right thing and pay them or not. And also, um, purchasing on payments. That's the perfect way of saying, I don't have this money, but I still want to spend it, even though I don't have it. And so I'm going to buy something on payments, which, by the way, is seriously ridiculous. You're paying interest on an item that you didn't absolutely have to have that you couldn't have afforded in the first place. Um, Proverbs 13.7 There is one who pretends to be rich but has nothing. Another pretends to be poor but has great wealth. How many times do you see that? People driving around in these nice convertible cars and they, they don't own it. They're, it's out on a loan. Um, let's see. Proverbs 22, 26-27 Do not be among those who give pledges, among those who become guarantors for debt. If you have nothing with which to pay, why should he take your bed from under you? So he's talking about two things. Uh, buying things that you can't afford, but then also, um, where was it, 26? Uh, being a, Giving pledges and that kind of stuff. So not only, we're not, we're not just talking about uh, taking things out on credit either. We're also talking about helping other people get into credit. Both things are a big mistake. You don't know how many times I see parents... Co-sign a loan for their kids. Big mistake. Big mistake. When kids move out, what is it that they always tell their parents? You know, stay out of my life. Let me live my own way. Let me do this. So let them live their own life. If they want to get into debt, let them do it. But don't have anything to do with it. That's like that's like stamping your seal of approval on their stupidity. Debt, especially in young kids, is a big mistake because they don't realize what they're doing. They sign mortgages willy-nilly and they don't even realize you know, what, what they're doing to themselves. This is a 30-year commitment. They haven't even been alive 30 years. You know, this a lot could happen in 30 years. Um, so, uh, let me make sure I read all those verses. Uh, Romans 13, 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Owe nothing to anyone. Um, don't plan on money you don't have. Uh, car payments, for instance. Oh, I'll have that money. Can you guarantee that you won't lose your job, that nothing will happen, that will ever jeopardize that, and you'll be able to pay those month-to-month -month -month payments on your card? No, you can't guarantee that. Now, that, but as, we, as I already mentioned, that's a, that's a waste of your money because the car is depreciating faster than you're paying for it. Um, buying things on credit. When you, know, when you don't have money and you spend it anyways, that is foolishness manifested. Um, unworked hours. Oh, well, I'm getting more hours on Friday. I'll, I'll, I'll earn the money that, I, that I'll spend then. Don't ever spend money that you're counting on. Oh, well, I usually, this person usually gives me money on Fridays. Well, yeah, but did they give you the money yet? No? Well, then don't do it. Oh, well, I, I usually get overtime on these days. Oh, well, um, I, my boss said that I'm coming in on, on Saturday. Well, it doesn't matter until you have the money in your pocket. Don't spend it yet. And then once you do have it in your pocket, don't let it burn a hole. Don't let it burn a hole. Let every single dollar have a place to go. This dollar goes to my savings account. This dollar pays off my electric bill. This dollar goes to my checking account, for, you know, for whatever. Just make sure that your money doesn't just have wings. If, 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 if you have cash in your pocket, it soon won't be. Let's just put it like that. If you carry cash in your pocket, it soon won't be. Don't don't walk around waiting to spend your money. Um, okay. So avoid get-rich schemes. Quick, easy, or free money. They always claim that. Oh, uh, hey, quick, quick, easy money, easy money. No, there is no such thing as easy money. Um, some some people think that gambling is easy money. Nope. Buying the lottery ticket. Oh yeah, because that because because you actually know somebody who's won that. Usually not. Um, just saying, if you would just save up your money instead of buying a lottery ticket every day, you'd have a lot more money. If you'd stop spending your money on alcohol and just set it aside, 
you would find that that that, that you would have more money around. And I, I know that some people drink because you know of things that have happened in their past. Let me just say this: get help. Get help. Alcohol is not helping you at all. In fact, it's just making your situation worse, and it's making you repeat a, a, a very bad situation over and over again. And I know it's not that easy to, oh, I can just quit whenever I want. I know that. But ask for help. Get help. Make yourself accountable to somebody. Proverbs 10.16 says, The wages of the righteous is life. The income of the wicked, punishment. And then uh, in 15.27... As you can see, Proverbs has a lot to say about money. He who profits illicitly troubles his own own house, but he who hates bribes will live. Um, so, money is earned through persistently working hard. You get a job, you stay at that job, and you work there for a long time. Um, run from laziness. Um, and we're going to talk about what is laziness um, later. But uh, not working, if, if you don't have a job, get a job. Don't don't settle for that lie that oh you cannot get a job. You can get a job. There are always jobs out there somewhere, and we'll talk about we'll talk about that in future lessons. But don't let yourself become a victim. Oh nobody's hiring me. Or I'm just this. Do, 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 do. You, what you're doing is you're telling yourself I'm a victim. Everybody is wronging me. You've got to let those let those kinds of mindsets go so that you can better yourself. So that you can get out there and actually get a job and start making a contribution to society. Society doesn't owe you a living. I used to watch Disney, um, Disney cartoons, and, and Goofy um, w would sing this song. Oh, the world owes me a living. And it's just, <laughs> it, it's, it's funny, but I mean, seriously, a lot of people do, do hold to that. So Proverbs 6, um, 10 through 11 says, A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Your poverty will come in like a vagabond, and your need like an armed man. Um, and then 10.4 uh, says, Poor is he who works with a, a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. So getting up late, you know, I'll just sleep five more minutes. How many times does that five minutes turn into an hour later? Not completing tasks, starting something and not finishing it, starting something expecting somebody else to finish it, um, head in the clouds always thinking about all these other things that you could do, all these other things that you have to get done, all these dreams and, and wishes that you hope you know you can complete and all these things, and you just get this mentality like every, like somehow everybody else is against you or something. You are not the victim. Okay, just flee from that laziness. Get a job. Start completing the things that you start that you that you started, and uh, get get your mind on the game here. Um, so everything you have is a blessing, okay? And and you have to understand that to get out of the victim mentality. People who see themselves as victims, they repeat the same destructive cycles over and over again, and then always think that they're being victimized. People who don't allow themselves to be victimized and just allow themselves to believe, no, I can choose to do this. I can go get a job if I really want. See what I mean? And you start changing the way you think. And when you start changing the way you think, you start changing the way you act. And when you change the way you act, the situations around you change. So, um, God, people, and government don't owe you anything. You know, we nowadays we got this idea, God owes us something. He owes us, you know, now evidently he owes us our salvation for one thing, which, you know, is not true. But then we start thinking that God has to give us these blessings. People now become, uh, are indebted to us in some way, rather than rather than treating them like Christ did. And government, now we're, we're, we're expecting a, a, a government handout. We are expecting it now. Um, so it's important if you actually want to get past these things to stop making up excuses and start setting your goals on what you can accomplish rather than noticing all the things you can't. So um, I do want to point something out because a lot of people have this idea that if you just put your mind to it, you can become rich. That's not true. You cannot just put your mind to something and become rich. The Bible says that some are made poor and some are made rich. But uh, However, it also does say that all must be content in Christ and wise with what they have. That's what the Bible teaches. Um, so. Philippians 4, Philippians 4, 11 through uh, 12 says, 
Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along uh, with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hung hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. Um, so Proverbs 22... Oops, where am I going? Proverbs 22, 2. Um, the rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. And then in 22, 9... He who is generous will be blessed, for he gives some of his food to the poor. And then 22.16, He who oppresses the poor to make more of for himself, or who gives to the rich, will only come to poverty. 37-9, The Bible strongly warns against being stingy. 37-9 says, Two things that I asked of you, do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I not be uh, be fool and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. So, um, you cannot um, you cannot simply put your mind to being to being rich. You can't just put your mind to it and okay, you're going to be rich. That's 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 cute by all means. But when you're out there in the trenches and you start actually seeing real people with real problems, you start understanding that that's not true, especially um, in a capitalistic uh, society. Now, I know there's a lot of fans of, of capitalism in America, but ultimately um, the theory behind it doesn't play out so well in actual lives. Um, Trickle-down economics, I mean, it's a good idea, but unfortunately, it kind of fails to see that humans are in the mix. And any time that humans are in the mix, it's not going to be as good of a theory as you think it's going to be. So, um, you know, obviously, with, with, with things we need to be a little bit understanding. You know, not, not every time that we see someone poor, oh, they could get out of it. Sometimes they couldn't have. Things just happen sometimes. Um, or, you know, we shouldn't look up at the rich and say, oh, well, or, you know, um, maybe they inherited it. Maybe they put their, maybe they, they put their, put their, um, what is it, nose to the grindstone as that goes, and, uh, you know, worked really hard for that money. You, you don't possibly know how, why somebody else is rich or why somebody else is poor. So it's best to not judge them for that. Um, and just do the best with what you have at your disposal. Wealth is not the goal, however, and be content with whatever you have. Um, now I do want to do want to kind of live on that. I mean, not not live on that, but play on that a little bit. Don't live paycheck to paycheck. See, what people do is they think that wealth is the goal. They think that if I just need more money, I just need more of this, and I'll be happy or whatever. Um, or they think if I just have this, I'll be happy. Or if I have more money, I'll be able to get the things that I need. Wealth is not the goal. Don't let yourself be fooled into the lie that it is the goal when it's not. Um, be content with whatever you have. Really, honestly, truly, be content with whatever you have. And don't live paycheck to paycheck. What happens is we get a paycheck, we spend it all, and then we're waiting for our next paycheck so we can spend it all. What happens if an accident happens? What happens if, you know... So, wives, do not spend um, without your husband's permission. Honestly, you don't know how many times in counseling the wives are out there just throwing, throwing money out the window. They're just buying it all kinds of stuff. And I get... I get that you that you there's some things that you want and some things that you need and whatnot. Ask your husband for it and wait. I mean, goodness sakes, don't cause a conflict just because you had to have something. Um, so don't do it without your husband's permission. Respect and obey your husband. Honestly, uh, I know um, I'm not trying to sound sexist or anything, but honestly, respect and obey your husband. Um, husbands, do not ignore your wife's say. What husbands like to do is they like to to just because they have the final say in a household, they like to take advantage of that and almost be abusers of, of, of that authority and start spending money without any knowledge of what the wife's doing. Oh, well, you know, I have the right to do this. Well, okay, even if you did have the right, which I don't think that you do because, once again, spouses are equal, um, respect and love your wife. Let, let, just, let me just say that. Respect and love your wife. Um, and let your wife have a say so, honestly. Even if you don't think she deserves it, still let her have a say-so. She is an equal partner. 
the finances are not yours, they're not hers, they're yours. So, um, as in y'alls. Okay, um, Ephesians 5.21 uh, says, um, I'll just read it to you. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So listen to others' advice. I'm sorry, I, I missed one. Neither can make um, neither can make a decision on their own. Husbands, do not spend without your wives. Okay. Wives, do not spend without your husbands. Okay. And don't just look for. Okay. Well, they said okay. Did they mean it though, or are they just giving you giving your permission because they know what you're going to do anyways? Sometimes a spouse can just reach the place of not wanting to fight, so they'll say yeah, sure, whatever, do whatever you want, and they don't actually want you to spend that money. So listen to the things that they're not saying too. I mean, honestly, if, 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 if you put forth that work of listening, they'll see that you start starting to pay attention. They'll actually share, at least in principle, they'll share um, what they actually are thinking. So listen to others' advice and be accountable for major purchases. Um, this kind of goes hand in hand. First off, listen to others' advice. Should I buy this? What do you think? But then also be accountable for major purchases. Even if you're single, be accountable to somebody. Is this a wise investment of my money? You know, and then when they actually when they give you input, actually listen to them. And especially, don't ever ask somebody something that you're just gonna ignore whatever they say if it doesn't fit what you already decided that you want them to say. Proverbs 11:14 says, "Where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counselors, there is victory." So listen to the advice of others. Um, never, ever, 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 ever cosign for a loan. Never do that. Never co-sign for a loan. You cannot guarantee what that person is going to do. It doesn't matter if they're your father, your daughter, your cousin, your... I mean, it doesn't matter. Your spouse. Don't, don't co-sign for a loan. Well, okay, your spouse is different because you should both be... If you do take out loans, you should be a partnership in the things that you do. So, But still, don't co-sign for other loans. Um, Sing at Thessalonians um, 3.11... And once again, says, For we hear that some among you are, are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Sometimes we have kids that are kind of maybe not doing things right. And so we try to show them support by condoning their activity. Okay, Supporting and condone, condoning are two different things. You can support your kids and not condone their actions. Does that make sense? So you need to be supportive, yes. Condone, no. And sometimes supporting is not helping them get into making stupid mistakes. Okay, if they don't have good enough credit to buy a house, maybe they should live with the decisions that they've made. See what I mean? In other words, you're going to rob God of a chance to teach them something. God is trying to teach them something through life situations, and you are bailing them out all the time. Are you constantly bailing your kids out of jail, paying for their expenses, giving them this and that? Or are you allowing them to make their mistakes so that they can learn from it? Because let's be honest, as much as you'd like them to learn everything, that you, uh, to listen to everything that you're teaching them, they're not going to. It, it, it's, it's, it's naive to assume that your experience is going to mean as much to them as it did to you. As much as that would be a good thing that that, that, that happened, but it's never going to be like that. Uh, people need to always need to experience stuff. Um, so, anyways, but just don't co-sign for, co for a loan, um, especially. Um, oh, just so many things here that, that, that I could I could go into. Ne never give money to the irresponsible or the lazy. If somebody is not working, neither should they be taking your money either. Um, if somebody is not getting up and taking care of stuff, why should you get up and take care of their stuff for them? Don't waste your resources on someone who's stubborn and prideful. Are they willing to change? Are they are they just are they just you know being a Grinch about it? Well, why should you have to clean up for their messes? Um, and I'm not talking about not being Christian. I'm talking about um, not violating the principles of Scripture. Because what happens is this: we try to override God's authority by getting our kids out of the situations that they got themselves into, and then God starts to remove his blessings from you. What? Yes. When you aid an immoral person in their immorality, you will always follow suit in, in punishment. It will always happen. Especially if you knew better, 
from reading the word and you did not listen. Uh, 17, 18 says, Proverbs 17, 18 says, A man lacking in sense pledges and becomes guarantor in the presence of his neighbor. A man lacking in sense. Um, Proverbs 13, 25. The righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the stomach of the wicked is in need. The stomach of the wicked is in need. 19, 17 says, one who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deed. Um, and then uh, 22, 1. A good, and by the way, don't ever expect a poor man to pay you back. Just let it go. Proverbs 22, 1. A good name is to be more desired than great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold. Let's not forget that. I think this is my second time reading that in this lesson. Um, so, God opposes those who are evil. Don't ally, your, ally yourself with the evil person. Make a flow chart, excuse me, of total income and expenses and cut out all the necessary spending. To do this, add up all your receipts and, 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 and separate them into need and want. Now remember, need is food and water that you had to have, not all those snack foods and all that junk. I'm talking about the food, the food that you actually needed. Things like vegetables and fruit and bread and that kind of stuff. Um, and then in the other section, put you know the things that you did in, in going out to eat in restaurants, the cell phone bill, the uh, cable, and all that stuff, and, and start to see the imbalances of your checking account. That the majority of your money is going to something where it shouldn't be going to. Um, um, also, prioritize sp your spending by making a budget. You put tithes and offering first. Then your expenses that for like your your rent and that kind of stuff, and then um, uh, your savings, and then after the savings, your excess. And, and why it's important to do that is because the savings account is for emergencies, not the credit card. The savings account, because what if you have an emergency, you put it on the credit card, and then you can't pay it back because that emergency is oh I don't know you lost a job for instance. See what I mean? Never use a credit card as your emergency account. Um, Matthew 6.21, and there's honestly so much more that I could say about finances. I'm choosing not to because, honestly, I'm, I'm already on the third video for this lesson. Uh, 6.21 says, um, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, this will show where your heart's at. Is the majority of your money going to uh, to the church, to the to to missionaries, to that kind of stuff, to Good Samaritan Fund, and those kinds of things, or is the majority of your money going to restaurants? You know, it's it, 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 I know I know we've made a big thing about you know um, historically homosexuality in the church and drugs and that kind of stuff. You know, overeating is has the same mindset behind it as doing drugs and, and drinking and smoking all do. It's okay. It's the same mindset that leads us into those things. I have a very serious problem when somebody has a huge gut and is telling someone that they need to stop, you know, looking at porn or, or smoking or whatever. It's like, well, maybe you should stop glorifying your belly. Especially if you're a pastor or some other church leader, you should probably stop glorifying your belly. Um, so, Keep record of where your money is going. The little things do add up. People think, oh, I'm just going to buy a little thing here, and then there's another little thing there, and another little thing there, until finally all those little things do add up to a lot of big things. Um, so and we'll talk about a, a spending budget in just a minute. Um, save coupons. Be a coupon clipper. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. You can save lots of money with that. And my wife does that. Uh, don't shop hungry. You'll always end up buying things that you don't need. Um, free money doesn't exist. Someone always has to pay with, to, has to pay from it. Oh no, you don't understand. I get it from the government. I get it from the store. It was a giveaway. It was this. No, no, somebody is paying for that. It's coming from somewhere. There is no such thing as free money because that would mean that it it, ex it, it did not exist and it just appeared in front of you. And it seems how that probably didn't happen. We can safely assume that somebody paid for that money somewhere. So also don't think that the church is, is a piggy bank that you can just go and hey I need this X amount of money and to, to make the, the trip to my to this funeral. Well, it's not don't misunderstand me. It's not the church's problem 
whether you have to go and pay for something, okay? The church's problem is establishing God's kingdom. And I know that social needs are a part of that, but that money doesn't isn't doesn't go to your pocket for gas money. That money goes to supplying for the ministers, to supplying for the ministries, to supplying for the for, for things that, that it needs to do for the community and that kind of stuff. That's what the what it's supposed to meant, be meant for, not 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 for you. So don't get offended when a pastor won't give you the money. Um, and just because there are some churches that do go above and beyond and decide to do something like that, doesn't mean that all should follow suit. Proverbs eleven four says, "Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but un, but righteousness delivers from death." And then uh, fifteen eleven fifteen. He who is a guarantor for a stranger will surely suffer for it, but he who hates being a guarantor is secure. So, lack of finances can be caused um, by, first off, not working. Who knew? If you don't work, money doesn't come in. Uh, also, another, another reason for, for, bad for bad, a, la a lack of finances is bad stewardship. Uh, not using the money that you do have correctly, not maintaining the things. For instance, oh, I have to buy, um, I have to buy a new fuel pump for my car because I you know, didn't ever take care of my car and putting in the injector, what's it called, fuel injector cleaner? I mean, it's little things like that, that that you could have prevented in maintenance, but now you have to pay for in a big sum. That's bad stewardship. Um, or putting your money in, in one of those, um, oh, I still can't remember it. Um, I think it's just called a CD account. I think that's what it's called. No, I, I called it CDC earlier, but I think it's just called a CD account. And uh, putting it in that, uh, you, you putting a bunch of money in a savings account rather than investing it into something or, or, or uh, buying stocks or something, um, you know, once again, uh, bad stewardship. Or here's another one where people don't have enough money to invest in something, and then they invest, and then stock prices drop, and they cash out. Well, that was stupid. <laughs> Anyways. Um, Another another thing is uh, disobedience and sinfulness. Uh, if we disobey the Lord, if we're living in sin, the Lord will remove uh, financial blessings. If we are not living in submission to our authorities, God will uh, remove financial blessings. Um, you know, there's a lot. There's just disobedience and sinfulness. So uh, Proverbs ten three says, uh, the Lord will not allow the righteous to hunger, but he will reject the cravings of the wicked. He will reject the cravings of the wicked. So everything we do reflects either positively or negatively on God and his kingdom. We have to remember that as Christians, everything we do reflects on God and his kingdom. Luke chapter 19, 11 through 27 says, um, while they were listening to these things, um, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said, A nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself, and then return. And he called ten of his slaves, and gave them ten minas, and said to them, Do, do business um, with this until I come back. But his citizens uh, hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over, over us. When he returned, after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared, saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing. You are to be in authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Your mina, master, has made five minas. And he said to him also, um, and, and you are to be over five cities. Another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down, and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, By your own words I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you not know that I am an exacting man, uh, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Keep in mind that he preserved the mina. He preserved that. And he was still called wicked for preserving it. We are not called to end with the same thing that we started with, but to be a good steward of it and growing it and increasing it. Then why did they not? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. 
Then he said to the bystanders, Take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has the ten, min the ten minas. And they said to him, Master, he has ten minas already. I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. So, um, the fear of the Lord, I know this is talked about in Proverbs, is two things. First off, the fear of the Lord is submitting to instruction. It is it is allowing yourself to be disi discipled, allowing yourself to, to listen to the advice of others. But also it's not living um, for yourself, it's living for God. So if you fear the Lord, that means that you're going to fear the consequences of rejection of the Lord, which means that you're going to live wisely. Basically, you have a basis for living morally because of God. So this is how you would compose a flow chart, okay? You have uh, your total expenses that you're going to add up all together. And what that's going to look like is you're going to take your highest bill that you normally, the bills that you have, and then you're going to add 10% to that. And so when it comes to expenses, always overbid, okay? Let's say your average in electricity bill was is fifty dollars. That's your average on your electricity bill. Okay, but one time you paid, you had to pay seventy dollars. So this is how you would add up your expenses for any given month. Take seventy, add ten percent, which is seven dollars. That's seventy-seven dollars. You could even round it up to eighty dollars just to be safe, and that could be your electric bill for the month. See what I mean? So what's going to happen when you don't have to pay that much? You're covered. But if you do have to pay that much, well, it's not a big deal. See, that's why you take your highest bill that you pay on something, and then you add 10% to that, and that leads to um, to give you a good a good uh, estimate there. So first off, in your flow chart, you want to put your tithes and offering, and you want to add that up, any, any um, offerings that you regularly have. Um, or that you want to be giving or something. And then you add your, your bills. That would be your electric, your gas, your car insurance, water and trash, uh, clothes, uh, credit card debt, mortgage. Okay, and then you're going to add all that up together. Okay. And um, and that's going to be your total for expenses. So that means whatever, whatever, however much you earn, it has to be at least that much. Now, I would honestly suggest that somewhere in here you have a certain amount that you put into your savings account or something like that for uh-oh money just in case. Um, but it's not absolutely necessary for this stage. Eventually, you're going to want to do that. But for this stage, it's not really important. If you've never made a flow chart, then it's kind of not really that important to know about that. But, okay, and then what you want to do is you want to add all your income. So what you do is you underbid your income. You're, let's say you have two jobs. What's the lowest paycheck you've ever gotten? Now 10% less than that, and then your second job and 10% less than that. Then um, add up how much you'd make if you lost one of those jobs, and always say, what if I lost the better paying job if you have two jobs? And that will give you a good um, a good basis for knowing where you where you stand. Wow, I'm already living outside of my means. And what does it mean to live outside of your means? Where your income says you make two thousand a month, and your your expenses say that you spend twenty eight hundred dollars a month. That would be living outside of your expense outside of your um, means. So what do you do if that's the case? First off, uh, stop all unnecessary spending. So stop eating out. Stop um, stop buying unnecessary junk foods and that kind of stuff. Uh, stop buying video games and that kind of stuff. Uh, next, try to cut down on your bills. Uh, turn off uh, turn off lights when you're not using them. Unplug things when you're not using them. Um, don't leave the air conditioner running all the time. That kind of stuff. Um, and then you want to, um, after you've tried to lower all your bills that you do have, then you want to um, then you want to get rid of the bills that you don't have to have. Well, I really need my phone. Do you? Be honest with yourself. Do you need it enough to lose your house over? Because when it comes down to it, you're either going to have to pay your phone bill or your mortgage. You can't pay both unless you have the money to pay both, and then you can. Um, so your your cable, do you need that? Your internet, you don't really need that. So I mean, and and like call in on your on your phone, say, okay, I have this plan. Can I get this next lower plan? And how much money will that save me? See what I mean? Um, stop driving your car around so much. Maybe sell one of your cars if you have multiple cars. Um, do whatever you need to cut down the unnecessary things to make sure that you're living in your means. 
So you can find a job, don't give up. Honestly, I know sometimes it's really hard to find a job. I know that. Okay, the area that I live has a high poverty level. I, I get that. Okay, but just keep searching and don't give up. And whatever you do, do, do not ever give yourself an excuse for not looking for a job anymore. Oh well, nobody's hiring, so I'm just not even going to try anymore. Well, uh, even if nobody is hiring, you should still try. Um, so. Um, what if you lose your job? Are you covered? Do you have any 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 um, emergency money? See, what I mean, that's why you always set aside money. Um, you can't depend on your job past the day that you are currently working, which is today. Um, always set aside money and savings for emergencies. What happens if something unexpected happens? Your wife gets pregnant when you weren't even trying, and when you were using protection, um, your uh, your kid falls and breaks his arm. Uh, your your car suddenly blows up. I mean, I don't know. Just the unnecessary, the un un um, unplanned. Prepare for the unplanned. Because in life, the one thing that you can always plan for is not being prepared. I mean, you can try to be prepared, but ultimately, life will throw you curveballs. So what you do is you plan for those curveballs. Have money in your account so in case anything happens, you can pay for it. Um, always set aside money and say, I already mentioned that. Only spend on credit card on the credit card what you already have. Don't double spend, and we already talked about that. Um, cars depreciate faster than you buy them. We already talked about that. Keep receipts and add up how much you spend eating out, and you might be surprised how much money of, how much of your money is going to waste. Here's a chart just to show a little bit of an example. Over the series of 15 years. You add one thousand dollars of debt with an interest annually of one hundred and twenty dollars. So, on the far right is is the column that says total debt. Now, if you look, the first year you owe um, one thousand one hundred twenty dollars, but by the end of the fifteenth year, you owe a total debt of forty one thousand seven hundred fifty four dollars. Does that, does that make sense? And the interest added in that year was 4474 just in interest that was added. So debt increased by only $1,000 every year at 12% fixed uh, interest compounded annually. Okay, So let's kind of break that down. First off, the interest rate was, interest rate was 12%. Okay, That's 12% of however much is, is there. Um, now it was a fixed interest rate, so it's not that means a fixed interest it means it's not going to the, the interest rate is not going to change. And it's compounded annually. Okay, so however much, basically, what this comes out to is however much money you have. Hold on. However much money you have at the end of that year in debt is is gonna is gonna change how much you are charged in interest. Okay. Um, and just so that we're on the, on the same page, uh, usually credit cards have somewhere in the twenty percent somewhere interest rate. Um, Depending, it it'll change depending on the credit card company or the bank associated with it, the uh, what your credit score is, you know, different things like that. So okay, compounded annually basically means the more debt, the more interest charged per year. Okay, so what happens is the first year you're paying interest on just the principal, but then the second year you're paying interest on the last year's principal plus whatever principal from this. Year. I'm sorry, I added, I said that wrong. On whatever the current principal is, for instance, if you took out more of a loan, plus the interest that was added to it from the year before, unless you paid that off. Um, Twenty-six thousand seven hundred fifty-four dollars of interest in fifteen years, more than the total money borrowed, almost by twice. Okay, the, how much money was borrowed? One thousand per year would equal fifteen thousand dollars. So that means that in interest over those fifteen years, compounded annually at a twelve percent fixed rate, you. I owe twenty-six thousand seven hundred fifty-four dollars just in interest. So this brings the total that you owe, if you looked up there, um, to forty-one thousand seven hundred fifty-four dollars. Okay, and twenty-six thousand dollars that almost twenty-seven thousand dollars. In fact, let's round up twenty-seven thousand dollars is of that is just interest. You know, I I, <laughs> I was listening to this one woman and she was telling her husband, "Oh, I bought this for two hundred dollars." Well, actually, she paid two hundred and ninety-nine dollars, so it was actually three hundred dollars that she paid for it. So, anyways, um, <clears throat> you can buy on your credit card and pay it off every month and earn rewards, but you need to practice self-control. You cannot have everything you want or see. Being good with money is not mystical; it is simply having discipline over your financial decisions. 
that's how easy it is. It's, it's not mystical. You don't need to go and get empowered by some seminar. Um, so um, if, if you pay $6,000 per year on that debt balance and, and attempting to pay it off, let me move this again. This thing's really getting in the way. Um, it will take you 16 more years just to pay it off. 16 more years. It took you 15 years to get into it. It's going to take you another 16 years. That's a total of 31 years. 31 years of debt. You will pay $53,696 more in interest. You will pay a grand total of $80,450 in interest, which brings you to a grand total of just shy of $100,000 from $15,000 in loans. Just from adding $1,000 a month, just from adding $1,000 a month, I'm sorry, a year, sorry, $1,000 a year, at a 12% uh, 12 um, fixed interest rate compounded annually. That is, that is insane. And you know, people do a lot worse of deals now, nowadays. So questions to ask when you are taking out a loan. Let's run through these real quick, because this is gonna probably be, I think this is the last thing, let me check. Yeah, this is the last thing. Um, question to, and, and to ask, is this loan fixed rate? And if so, what is that interest rate? Never take something that does not have a fixed rate, okay? How is the interest figured? Okay, sometimes you'll end up paying this huge balloon payment, and if you don't make that huge balloon payment, you lose whatever it is you're buying, the car or the house or whatever, and you have to be careful. If you don't understand the, the legal documents that you're signing, don't sign them, okay? Or get help before you sign them. But don't sign something that you don't understand, especially not to make yourself look dumb. That's the dumbest thing you can do. So what is the repayment length? How long is it going to take for you to pay off whatever it is that you're, that you're getting this loan for? How much will you end up paying total? The principal and the interest and the insurance Okay, and the escrow or whatever else, the taxes or you know different things that, that come along with it. And is there no other way to pay for it? Can you not pay for it any other way? Do you have to have this one thing? Can you can you maybe rent for a few years and then have the money to buy? Can you maybe uh, go without that new car and maybe just buy a used car? You know, can you maybe buy from a private seller rather than from a from a business? You know, weigh the options. Because um, once again, loan is a big thing. I know. I know. In today's society, we pass it off like it's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. So be careful when you're getting into debt. Um, how much will you pay on interest? What's the total interest that you will end up paying? I bought a house for just shy of sixty thousand dollars in interest. If I do not pay, if I did not pay it off in thirty years, in interest, I would have ended up paying. Uh, about about twenty five thousand dollars just in interest. That's not including the wasted money I would have spent on house insurance, on um, on uh, uh, taxes, and all kinds of other things. Now, obviously, taxes you're not going to be able to get out of if you own a house. You are going to have to pay taxes. But I mean, still, you surely you get what I'm saying about about the payments. Also, the the bank will tell you something like this: Oh, your payments will only be two hundred something dollars. No, you, your payments with just your principal and interest will be that. But then, and you're going to notice that your interest is actually, you're going to be paying more towards your interest than you are towards your principal throughout the first half of your loan period, unless you pay more on it than, than you're meant to. Um, but then on top of your escrow payment, you're, it's going to double it. If you owe 200 and something dollars in principal and interest, your, your mortgage payment is going to be somewhere around 500 or $550. Okay? That's a big difference. So, um, how much will your payments be with insurance and maintenance added? What about maintenance? Don't forget maintenance. How much of your payment goes to the principal? And is does that number change at all or is that a set number? Can you afford it? When I say can you afford it if you lost your job today and weren't able to find another job for six months, could you still afford it? That's what I mean by can you afford it. Um, do you need it? Oftentimes people buy a house just to get pleasure in the fact that they have a house when the truth is they may not necessarily need that house. And the thing is, is it's good, a good idea to buy a house, especially at a young age, because then when you're older, you don't have a house payment. But that can also be a bad thing because if you end up moving or anything, you just have a house that you can't get rid of and your finances get split and then there's unnecessary strain on your marriage. So I hope that I explained everything well enough. Um, 
really talk to somebody about interest. And I don't mean interest. I mean um, investing in something because it is a good idea to invest. But talk to somebody who knows. Really and genuinely, talk to somebody who knows. I know the very basic bare minimum of investment. That's it. Okay. So talk to somebody who knows, and and and, and learn from that. Uh, next lesson is a church function. I really hope that you enjoyed this, and uh, I'll see you.